Hi there. This week's video is brought to you by my usual run of luck, where we have had some real good progress and then everything goes straight to shit. So we'll uh, start by powering up one of the Cray Discs. I realized that uh, after complaining the other day that I didn't have any HVD controllers, in fact I had, it was right in front of me. The Isbus SCSI cards from the uh, Ultra 2 is in fact a high voltage differential device. All of the other cards I have, all of the other PCI cards are LVD or single ended. These are the only HVD ones that I can find. Now the good news is I have these things coming out my ears. So after I figured out how to enable the terminators on these drives, which thanks to those wonderful people at Seagate, if I can get the friggin' book open, you can still download all of the bloody manuals for these things. I have this set to ID SCSI 1 and the internal terminators are turned on. This is good because, turn on the machine, there it goes, the HBA ID on these guys is zero. With um, PC controllers it's usually seven, but this was defaulted to seven, so once I got that moved off, we were in good shape. So we have our HVD drive, our HVD controller, our SCSI cable, our Ultra, things are looking good. The uh, next thing that we have to have happen is to make sure that the sun can find it. And so if we talk to our SCSI controller and we say hello, and this is our Q-Logic card here. Seagate ST4108000W. So this is my beautiful, beautiful, big, fat, cray, scuzzy disc. Things are looking up. So we go stop, and we say boot, my beautiful boot. And unfortunately, my problem is intermittent. So we will see if it's going to play or not. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. And that would be it right there. Wait for it. Oh, no, wait. Wait just a second. There it goes. So I think the power supply is... Well, it's either browning out. Oh, that's not cool before we make it much worse. Let's just shut it all down. Isn't it always the way? So like I was saying before it all went even more pear-shaped than it already was. I think that either the power supply is browning out where it simply doesn't have the voltage to, or rather the amperage to keep the system running or there is such a ripple on the power rails that the system is thinking the system's failing, so it brings it down, and then on the upswing of the ripple, it brings it back up again. So on a power supply like this, any power supply frankly, there are a whole bunch of smoothing capacitors that try and ease off the ripple in that supply to try and give something that's as smooth and clean as possible. Now they're never always perfect, but they're usually pretty good. The capacitors, they dry out. I'm sure you've all heard stories about capacitors that explode as they're on their way out. Um, heck, I had it happen to my microvacs. But as they're drying out, they don't work as well as they used to. And it's possible that what's going on with this is that the capacitors that are on the output stage, they're just simply not doing their job properly anymore. And so where they used to smooth out that um, voltage, that output, they're just not doing it, and so the voltage is doing this. And so eventually it gets so bad that the system, when the voltage is dropping, re the power's failing, so it shuts the system down. Well, then it rebounds and starts ringing back up again. The system comes back up. 
Now this had happened to me a couple times before, but now it's doing it usually within about 30 to 60 seconds of powering the system up. I can no longer boot it into Solaris. Before it was happening after like an hour or two of run time. Uh, and that's the thing. So since I had the last video with this bloody thing, I have installed a fresh copy of Solaris 9. Um, it's working in 64-bit as the ID prom or the prom update video showed. I have the SWS software installed. The later of the two discs that I was given has a much more recent revision of the SWS. It knows what these later machines are like. It installed without a problem. The readme.install file was brilliant. It gave me everything. It knows what the uh, QFE is, the Quad Fast Ethernet. So it doesn't want to use the 10B2 or the Coax Ethernet, the thin net. It wants to use proper UTP, which means I really do have to do that RJ45 conversion on the Cray, but I was kind of planning on doing that anyway, and that's fine. So I was making great leaps and bounds. This system here, this hard disk, um, as you saw, it does come up. Moreover, Solaris does in fact recognize that it's there. It knows there's a disk there. Um, oh, before I go further, the brown out the ripple thing, in case it was related to the current draw, I've pulled the extra SCSI card, I've pulled the extra internal disk, the CD-ROM drives I'm uh, hooked from it, things like that. This drive here isn't powered off the internal machine either. I have an old uh, AT power supply driving it so that it doesn't have that ridiculous spin-up current and things like that on it. So it doesn't appear to be overall draw. Uh, which again is why I'm leaning towards a component failing like a capacitor. Anyway, so Solaris is really, really handy in that it really wants to help you find your disks. And one of the ways it does this is it scans the S bus when it powers on, and if it finds any disks that weren't there before, it will build out a disk tree for them. And so it lists all of the partitions that are on the disk. Uh, in Solaris terminology, that's a slice, but it's the same thing. Now on a sun disk, this is brilliant. You plug your sun disk in, you power your machine on, and all of a sudden all of your partitions have shown up. You can go straight to mounting them. They do have a bit of an odd quirk where slice 1 is usually slash, and slice 2 is slash export, I think. Or maybe it's slash var and then slice 2. Slice 0 is root, slice 1 is... Anyway, slice 2 is the whole disk from sector 0 to the last sector on the disk and then the rest of them go on from there. There's a swap partition somewhere on one of the slices as well. Um, old nomenclature? I don't know. Um, unfortunately, all of this stuff appears to be built around the assumption that it can read the partition table. This disk doesn't have a partition table. Even if it did, it sure it wouldn't be one that the sun would understand. And so while Solaris is busy enumerating out this device tree and trying to give me direct access to all of these partitions, that does me no good because it can't read the partition map because there isn't one. The slice 2, which I would like to hope goes from the start to the end of the drive, appears not to. It appears to need that partition map to tell it where the beginning and the end of the drive is, which is not that odd. The PRTVTOC, so the print table of contents, basically it's an fdisk hyphen L or a partition table dump. It freaks the hell out when it sees this disk. So um, there appears to be no obvious way to access the raw device that I found yet. Now, there must be a way. As a guy on one of the mailing lists pointed out when I asked this question, Solaris has to format the disk somehow, so it's got to have raw access to it somewhere. I haven't figured out where that is yet though. There's a slash div slash dsk, which is the buffered axis, and then there's slash div slash rdsk, which is the raw axis, which effectively only means unbuffered. Doesn't appear to make any difference there. Uh, I've wandered through the SBUS device trees, and that also enumerates out based on partitions. There's got to be a way to do it. There's bound to be a way, but I haven't figured out what the hell it is yet. 
If this was a Linux machine, I'd just do a DDIF and slash dev slash SDB or wherever the hell it fell on the bus and it would just work. Uh, unfortunately, Solaris's need to help you uh, is kind of tripping me up in this way. Anyway, it's just the way it goes with older equipment, I guess. Um, you get so far, getting all of the software installed, finally feeling like I was making some progress. I got the disk found, everything like that, figuring out how to... Um, well, anyway, I got onto a tangent and started whinging there for a minute, and I thought I'd better cut it off and maybe we'd uh, skip that part out. Thank you so very much for watching. I appreciate all of the comments, all of the suggestions, uh, all of the people that have offered to help. I'm really grateful. It's just another setback. The power supplies are not that expen expensive on eBay. They're like 60 bucks, so it's not like I'm screwed. Uh, it's just irritating. You know, uh, I spent a large part of the weekend messing with a PDP. We turned that damn thing off a hundred times because I had the cards in the wrong order and then uh, was using the wrong controllers and things like that. That was built in 1978. The damn thing works just fine. Anyway, I'm whining again. Thank you so very much. You guys have a wonderful evening. I'll catch you next time.